Do you know what nemesis means? A righteous infliction of retribution manifested by an appropriate agent. Personified in this case by me. If you read the Bible, Mark, you'd know that there won't be another thousand years. Right now we're in the last days as foretold in the book of the Revelation. last days? You mean the uh, coming of the apocalypse, right? The rapture. You only have to look at the signs. There are wars and rumors of wars. Now, just that... so the, the rest of us know how much time is left, when is the rapture supposed to hit exactly? Is it uh, midnight New Year's Eve? That's right. Uh, now, is that midnight L.A. time or, or Eastern Standard Time or what? I mean, what time zone has got in anyway? I pray for you all. Gospel of Thomas saying number 18 The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us, how will our end come? Jesus said, Have you found the beginning then, that you are looking for the end? You see, the end will be where the beginning is. Congratulations to the one who stands at the beginning. That one will know the end and will not taste death. Happy heresies, my beloved true seekers. Welcome to the end of the world. Just pretend it's happening. Pretend the end of the world is here. The skies are a stew of flame. The laws of nature and science are useless. The cities are landscapes of broken, burning teeth. And humans have been devalued into worms. Your family is vulnerable and exposed and pretty much doomed. All that you've ever known is now a hot nightmare, bringing you to the precipice of insanity and despair. Hmm. Actually, I'm describing much of the world as we know it, but bear with me. Goal in life is not to eliminate misery, it's to keep misery to the minimum. And in this end, or one of the many ends of civilization, You'd have the usual blame games, pointing of fingers, repentance to the gods, and, worse, paltry CNN-style analysis of what went wrong. But the mind of the hylic and psychic humans never goes far enough, my beloved true seekers. They settle for whipped cream excuses. It is said that the future is always born in pain. The history of war is the history of pain. If we are wise, what is born of that pain matures into the promise of a better world because we learn that we can no longer afford the mistakes of the past. No, it's the nomadics, also called the Gnostics, that always glance back far enough to understand when gold turned into lead. The Gnostics always dared the hard questions and played the best philosophical CSI. For example, their ultimate theological question was what happened before creation and its birth pangs, brought about by the demented mind of a jealous God who thought he was the only God. If there is a God, he did not mean this to be so. If they tried hard enough, if they could pierce their third eye vision through the smoke of ignorant creativity, perhaps they might envision the time before time when reality and harmony were one and the same, and harmony was the movement and the rest of the treasury of light. And then they tried to make it manifest inside the caverns of their souls, lighting up the spirit shard that was originally part of that same treasury of light. Find the beginning and you'll find the end, and how to fix it, i.e. not taste death. And you can apply to most of the messes in your lives, by the way. But you have to go far enough. Like the Gospel of Philip says, truth, which existed since the beginning, is sown everywhere. And many see it being sown, but few are the one who see it being reaped. I want to live a real life. I don't want to dream any longer. The only problem is that the end, one of our ends, might truly be coming. My scenario is not hypothetical, and like I said, is real much across the globe. Western civilization might be tested again. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. 
Nothing apocalyptical like the Jack T. Chick fundagelicals wish with all the barcodes and the evil Catholic Church and gore and suffering and lakes of fire and they watching with glee from heaven. No, I'm speaking of the end of an age. Call it the information age, the technological age or whatever. And its imagery will be much like that of Jehovah and the Archons building the universe like some Saruman and Isengard building its troops. Except that censorship will be added into the stew, for it is the greatest of poison to the true seeker and free thinker. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. And then the Gnostics that live today might not get a chance for a while to take their astral flights and pierce the voids of fire of the Demiurge for the truth. For he will have created an even greater hell on earth to stop it. A small reflection of his heavenly smithies. Some of you have heard my speeches before about how the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are on a collision course and blah 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 and so forth and so forth. I don't know if we can top the 20th century in carnage, Jehovah's greatest achievements, but God will give it his best college try in an era in which Pakistani kids carry stingray missiles and weapons of mass destruction can be made as easy as pancakes. Mr. President, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair must. But I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed, tops, uh, depending on the breaks. It's coming. Can we do anything about it? Well, we have a small chance if we can go back in time and find out what went wrong. And with this information, liberate those who have been brainwashed by dogmatic ignorance in the slim hope they'll turn away from their bloodthirsty ways. Remember, he who finds the beginning will not taste death. In other words, he will awaken part of that person's indwelling Christ. Like the Apocalypse of Paul says, Let your mind awaken, so that you may know the hidden things in those that are visible. All that is visible must grow beyond itself, and extend into the realm of the invisible. On Aeon Bite, we often travel to the beginning of so many endings. And on this approximately Saturday, May 31st, 2008, we skate back in time to find the main reason the Abrahamic fates have been manipulated by the angels into both a cold and a hot war. And this has to do with none other than the founder of the three faiths himself, the old Babylonian Abraham. Yea, and God said to Abraham, you will kill your son Isaac. And Abraham said, I can't hear you, you'll have to speak into the microphone. And God said, Oh, I'm sorry, is this better? Check, 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 Jerry, pull the high end out, I'm still getting some hiss back here. The Gnostics believe the Demiurge was the master at giving the patriarchs misinformation, or simply picking the dullest tomato of the field, both that pertain to Abraham. To illustrate this, we have Professor Bruce Chilton, author of such books as Rabbi Paul and Mary Magdalene. Professor Chilton more than proves the time bomb set into the womb of the three religions when Abraham took his son, Isaac or Ishmael, depending on the religion, as a human sacrifice on Mount Moria. This is discussed in his new provocative work, Abraham's Curse, the roots of violence for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Bruce not only betokens the historical context and shift that happened after Abraham's attempted murder of his offspring became an exemplary holy did in the periscopes of the three religions. He also outlines the psychological damage throughout history and present day of the simple passes in Genesis 22. But there is one thing he cannot take away from you, your faith. Believe, for we will see God's wonders. Personally, I always thought that account was pretty morbid as a child. God wants to prove Abraham's loyalty by 86ing his son? Couldn't he have asked him to grow a basil garden or something? 
erect a marzipan statue or build him a golf course? What is so righteous about this request of God Almighty? But like good soldiers of Christ who are taught to accept Genesis 22 as another super duper tale and added reason to be obedient lambkins in the divine plan of eternal conflict. Like the Nazis, we just thought Abraham was following orders. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us, right? Monsieur has been locked! Well, like so many topics on Aeon Bite, formerly known as coffee, cigarettes, and gnosis, we will keep shoveling deeper into these orthodox accounts and see these fables, most probably not historical, for what they are. Anachronistic mind control devices that more than not have sent our young to die time and time again. Millions of Isaacs without a saving angel throughout history. I tell my kids, only God can make a life. Bruce also divulges in Abraham's curse that human sacrifice was predominant in those days from both the Jews and the pagans. And even after the death of Jesus, the alleged last sacrifice to Jehovah, the sense of martyrdom never left. Christians became small Christ ready to die for the God of this world. And let's not even get into Islam. On a side note, for those of you interested in the various and often hidden instances of human sacrifice in the Old Testament, I always recommend Tim Callahan's Secrets of the Old Testament. There are plenty of them. Legion, my beloved true seekers. The thirst for human flesh of Yaldabaoth goes way beyond sheep and turtle doves. God is a mean kid sitting on an anthill with a magnifying glass and I'm the ant. He could fix my life in five minutes if he wanted to, but he'd rather burn off my feelers and watch me squirm! But going back to Professor Bruce Chilton, his analysis and conclusions are precise and bone-chilling. The story is nothing but a black virus that modified the matrix of all three religions that claim their roots from Abraham. And Abraham's curse feeds you example after example of how it has manifested up to our modern days. Not a book to be missed unless you think that what Abraham went through is just the kind of test you want to be put through in order to show the world that your testicles are made out of angel trumpet steel. That's it, man. It's game over, man. It's game over. Look at the beginning and you'll see how it will end. Bruce reveals many beginnings to a story that changed with history. Some grimmer than others like when Isaac is actually killed but each with the same seismic resonance that has led us to these precarious times. But as Gnostics, we have a duty to speak matters to the sleeping that have no real desire to hear, gently offer as many red pills as possible. If we go full circle, there is always a chance we can cheat fate and the stars that rule our destiny. A small but worthwhile chance. We will not taste death. Enough of my dribble. You are in store for a hard ride, my beloved true seekers. Fasten your nicotine belts. Marine, what is that button on your body armor? A peace symbol, sir. Where'd you get it? I don't remember, sir. What is that you've got written on your helmet? Born to kill, sir. You write born to kill on your helmet and you wear a peace button. What's that supposed to be? Some kind of sick joke? No, sir. What is it supposed to mean? I don't know, sir. You don't know very much, do you? No, sir. You better get your head and your ass wired together or I will take a giant shit on you. Yes, sir. Now answer my question or you'll be standing tall before the man. I think I was trying to suggest something about the duality of man, sir. The what? The duality of man, the Jungian thing, sir. Whose side are you on, son? Our side, sir. Don't you love your country? Yes, sir. But how about getting with the program? Why don't you jump on the team and come on in for the big win? Yes, sir. Son, all I've ever asked of my Marines is for them to obey my orders as they would the word of God. We are here to help the Vietnamese because inside every gook, there is an American trying to get out. It's a hardball world, son. We've got to try to keep our heads until this peace craze blows over. Aye, aye, sir.
Today we have the uh, honor and pleasure of having a Professor Bruce Chilton, uh, who will be talking about his new book, Abraham's Curse, The Roots of Violence in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. How are you doing today, Professor Chilton? I'm very well, thank you. Good, glad to hear that. So why don't we get into, uh, before we get into the, uh, really the main thesis of your book, why don't we talk about why did human sacrifice become so important in ancient cultures, especially as in your book, you talk about that communal sacrifice and the holy meal and all that was really much more positive for a community's uh, psyche. Yeah, that's exactly the case. Very often, especially in the West during the modern period, we think in terms of sacrifice always being negative as something that you have to give up. But if we look at the most ancient literatures of sacrifice, what we see is that the sacrificial feast was indeed a feast. It was a place where people could enjoy themselves with their gods or their god, depending on the kind of religious system that they had. And the idea of sacrifice being instead the complete destruction of something valuable from which human beings got no benefit is one that only emerged during periods of crisis. Uh, an ancient community, let us say in the time before the foundation of cities, would look at natural disasters, famine, a bad crop, a plague, and interpret that as a divine anger against the community. And in this sense of crisis, would attempt to appease the gods by offering what was most valuable, namely human sacrifice. And the most valuable human sacrifice of all was, of course, the sacrifice of one's own child. So this was an important step, but in my opinion, it wasn't actually the pivotal step in the development of Abraham's curse. Uh, instead, the pivotal step was when ancient communities began to form themselves into cities. And as cities found themselves in a state of perpetual warfare, a city by definition uh, needed constantly to extend the territory it controlled in order to be able to produce enough to support its population. And it also needed to defend the lands that it already had. As a result, ancient cities, as distinct from ancient agricultural hamlets, were in a perpetual state of crisis. And that's when we see a routine of child sacrifice from as long as there have been cities during the Stone Age. And with that sense of crisis, there also comes the definition of sacrifice, no longer as the joyful feast with divinity, but now as something that human beings have to give up definitively in order to assure their survival. And the main theme of your book, uh, which again, as we talked before the interview, uh, is one of those you can put on the uh, how do we miss it before. But uh, why is the story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac instill the sense of martyrdom in the cultural DNA of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam? Why is that story so important? That is a fascinating development, which I must say, it gave me both a sense of horror and a sense of discovery uh, to investigate. That story of Abraham being ordered by God to sacrifice his son in Genesis 22 uh, appeared within Israelite religion at a time when surrounding cultures were actually engaged in child sacrifice. Uh, we have the example which comes from the same period from the ninth century before the Common Era of Misha, the king of Moab, 
while at war with the Israelites, sacrificing his own son in order to gain the victory. Uh, we have that act by Misha referred to within the Hebrew Bible, and also uh, we have the records of Misha himself going to war against the Israelites and describing his victory in terms of sacrifice. So the idea of human sacrifice was obviously very present to the writers of the Hebrew Bible when Genesis 22 was actually developed. And as a result of that, there is an ambivalence within the story. Abraham is told by God to sacrifice Isaac, and yet it's an angel that intervenes, telling Abraham that the sacrifice of his own child was not required, and that instead he should offer a ram. That opened the dreadful possibility, perhaps the divine will was really as initially stated and not reversed by the appearance of the angel at the end of the story. As a result, when at a much later period uh, the whole religion of Judaism was under extraordinary stress, the example of Abraham's willingness to offer his son was used in order to motivate people to become martyrs themselves and, more especially, to offer their own children in martyrdom. Uh, this occurred during the second century before the Common Era when Judaism confronted uh, the first deliberate attempt definitively to remove the practice of Judaism and any human being who would identify himself as a Jew from the face of the earth. Uh, this was under the dynasty called the Seleucids. Uh, they were successors to Alexander the Great. And it was one of their kings, Antiochus Epiphanes, who took over the temple in Jerusalem, set up his own altar there to Zeus, uh, insisted upon the sacrifice of swine there, uh, and deliberately killed uh, any young male child whom he found circumcised, also executed the parents and anyone who engaged in circumcision, and attempted to burn any copies of the Torah that he discovered. So this was a time when, if there was to be any survival of the Jewish people as Jewish, there had to be discovered the resources to answer this onslaught. And the answer was martyrdom. Uh, martyrdom both in the form of a willingness to go to war, even when defeat seemed inevitable, and martyrdom also as a willingness to die rather than to abrogate the Torah. We can see this new theology of martyrdom developed in what's known as Maccabean literature, that is, the literature that came out of this resistance force led by the family of Judas Maccabeus, which ultimately, against all the odds, was successful. And because it was successful, their literature was mainstreamed within Judaism. And in that literature, there was a very interesting change in the understanding of what was demanded of Abraham. Uh, instead of that act being a mere test of will, the motif emerged that what was best was actually to go ahead with the action and offer one's child in sacrifice. The martyrs of the Maccabean period believed, as they themselves said in this literature, that their blood was a purification, that their lives offered in obedience to the divine will assured the lives of those who would come after them. And it was during the period of this literature, that is from the second century before the Common Era on, that 
when Jews told the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, it was actually turned into a sacrifice. That is, it was no longer a near offering by the patriarch of his own son. Instead, Abraham went through with the action, shed his son's blood. Isaac died, and God raised him up again. Now that, of course, was a radical development in the way in which that story was perceived, but it was brought right into major celebrations of Judaism. For example, at the time of the Exodus, when Jews celebrated Passover, uh, some of the literature of this period records the belief that the reason that the angel of death passed over Israelite households in Egypt was that when the angel saw the lamb's blood, God actually saw the blood of Isaac. So this idea of the blood of Isaac, the blood of the martyr, became mainstreamed in Judaism. And in that mainstreaming, there came about one of the most radical and profound shifts in the development of religion in the West. And that is that martyrdom, following the example of Abraham and Isaac, was no longer seen to be merely a test of a few heroic individuals, such as the patriarchs but rather as a requirement that could be made of anyone within the entire religious system. Now that largely was why the Maccabees succeeded, why it was such a surprisingly successful force of opposition to a superior power. And yet, at the same time, what it meant was that now the reflex of martyrdom had been brought to the point where any believer whatsoever might be called to follow the example of Abraham and Isaac. But uh, in the uh, Old Testament, in the Tanakh, there are other instances of human sacrifice. Why is the story of Abraham so poignant and important? I mean, oh, God, yeah. asks, God asks for sacrifices, all the humans ask sacrifices all the time. He does, and yet this is the one case where it is a direct divine command for sacrifice in a positive sense. That is, Abraham is told to offer his son Isaac as he would offer a pleasing sacrifice to God. When God elsewhere in Tanakh orders the taking of human life, the purpose is not as a direct sacrifice to him, but rather as part of an institution which we know best from the books of Judges and Joshua called the harem, where God wants all the people who once lived in a village of the Canaanites destroyed. Uh, but the purpose of that destruction is to clear the way for sacrifice, not to offer those people as direct sacrifices to God. So what makes Genesis 22 especially poignant is that it is the one case within the Hebrew Bible where human sacrifice is not attacked or implicitly criticized, but rather held up as a positive example of what someone obedient to the God of Israel should do. But isn't there the story, and I can never pronounce his name, Jephthah and his daughter, who ends up... Uh, Jephthah, yes, Jephthah, indeed. Jephthah, yes, sorry. Exactly. Jephthah right. and his daughter, taken from the Book of Judges, which is another very clear indication that the story in Genesis 22 was developed within an environment in which human sacrifice was, in fact, widely practiced within Israel. And therefore the literature of the Israelites had to develop an answer uh, to this institution. And in the case of Jephthah, it does so. And it also records that it was a regular practice 
uh, in the springtime in Israel uh, for people, especially women, to remember Jephthah's daughter and to mourn on her behalf because Jephthah himself had taken a rash vow to Yahweh, the God of Israel. In his battle with a superior foe, he had promised Yahweh that if Yahweh would give him the victory, then he would offer in sacrifice the first person who came out from his encampment in order to meet him. And tragically for him, the first person out of the encampment is his own daughter. And she tells her father to go ahead with the action. She only asks that she be given time to mourn her virginity, as she says in the Hebrew text. That is, to lament the fact that she will not be able to give children to her people. And after that, he goes through with the oath. And the book of Judges tells us that this was an event that was commemorated within Israel. Now, how are we to take this commemoration is the basic question which is posed within the book of Judges. And that's why the presentation of Jephthah's rashness is very important to this text. This text wants to say that the only reason for Jephthah's sacrifice of his daughter was that he acted in a rash act manner that he didn't properly consider what the consequences of his oath were going to be. So that in that case, it falls into the overall presentation of the book of Judges, uh, according to which, as the refrain of the book goes, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, this was a lawless time, a time of chaos, and as a result, People acted often wrongly, even when they intended to be righteous. And Jephthah is presented in Judges as an example of that. And uh, another thing which uh, I've always found strange, but wasn't Isaac actually an adult at the time of uh, the sacrifice? I mean, uh, I know a lot of the Kabbalah and uh, other interpretations say that he willingly did it and had no problem, but uh, we're, all, we're all led to believe that he was a simple child, but he was actually an adult. One of the most fascinating aspects of the growing interpretation regarding Isaac at the time of his binding, or Akedah, within Judaism, is that Isaac literally grows in age over time. When he's presented within the biblical text, he is simply described as being a young lad, a na'ar, and one would surmise by the ordinary course of events that he would be around about nine years old. He asks questions of his father, which are very naive and poignant within the text, that suggest a kind of nine-year-old mentality of complete trust in his father Abraham, and at the same time, a lack of awareness of what was going on around him. As the example of Isaac was taken up within Maccabean literature, however, it was obviously crucial that Isaac, if he's going to be the example of a martyr, should know what he's doing. And as a result of that, he literally grew up. Uh, by the first century, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus refers to Isaac being 25 years old. Uh, it's interesting that because Josephus himself had been a general in the insurrection against the Romans, and he would have commanded young men of just this new age of Isaac around about 25 years old. But that wasn't the end of Isaac's maturation. By the time we come to the Talmudic period, he's now 37 years old. Now, why 37? Uh, there's both a substantial reason for that, uh, and there's also a technical reason for that. Uh, the substantial reason is that by the Talmudic period, Isaac is not only an example of 
a martyr. He's also an example of someone, because he actually died on Mount Moriah and then was restored to life, had been brought to study in the Heavenly Academy, where he could learn the Torah better than anyone else. Now, in order to learn the Torah, you have to be a fully matured man in the rabbinic understanding. And therefore, he had to be 37 years old. Uh, that, as I say, was the substantial reason for the new age of Isaac. The more technical reason for that uh, has to do with the age of Sarah and when Sarah had actually conceived Isaac. In the uh, passage that immediately follows the story of the Akedah, Isaac's binding, there is reference to the death of Sarah. And her death occurs when she is 127 years old. That's in Genesis 23.1. Now, she had conceived Isaac when she was 90. So if you do the math, uh, that makes uh, Isaac 37 years old right. at this point. Uh -huh. Now, of course, there's nothing to indicate in the book of Genesis that Genesis intended to be cross-examined in that way uh, in order to bring up a literal sequence of events. But that's the way the text was read uh, during the later Talmudic period. And so we ended up with a 37-year-old Isaac. Every text that mentions his age is telling you something about the mentality that produced that picture of Isaac. Is he the completely unconscious victim in Genesis 22, the original text? Or is he the willing soldier martyr of Josephus in the first century? Or is he rather the rabbinic ideal of someone who, because he's willing to die and to go through with the death, if necessary, can come to a perfect knowledge of the Torah? That's the Talmudic and Midrashic picture from the fourth century and later. Uh, these are not only technical questions. Often there are technical issues involved, but these are basically images of how it is that human beings should be willing to give their lives for the God of Israel. Bruce, moving on into the other uh, religion, how did the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac affect the matrix of early Christianity, uh, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the epistle of, his, of Hebrews and the writings of the Church Fathers? That's an excellent question. The epistle to the Hebrews is quite clearly a pivotal moment in the development of Christianity because it is there in the New Testament that Jesus is portrayed as being the one true sacrifice, the only offering that God had ever desired. Uh, the conception of the epistle to the Hebrews is that the entire religious system of Judaism that had centered on offering was in fact only a pale imitation of what God had desired all along, which was the perfect offering of his own son. So the argument of Hebrews is that, in principle, uh, all further sacrifice is unnecessary because the single appeasing act has already been accomplished. Interestingly, though, uh, Hebrews is also a letter uh, written around the year 95 during a time of persecution of Christians by the Romans, which insists upon the necessity of Christians, if necessary, resisting this Roman persecution, as the letter says, to the point of blood. That is, the epistle to the Hebrews tells you both that Jesus was the one true sacrifice that God desired, and that 
you may need to show your loyalty to that sacrifice by being willing to give your life. It's a very interesting mixed message, which then set the pace for new developments going on within Christianity itself. And uh, I love, uh, what is the connection, <laughs> which I love uh, that you find as uh, as a Gnostic, uh, what is the connection between the Gnostic uh, laughing Jesus concept and Isaac himself? The battle over Christ's laughter is one of the most interesting disputes in early Christianity because it shows the differing attitudes towards the significance of suffering. Uh, Within the second century, uh, there were teachers who argued, some for differing reasons, that at the moment of the crucifixion, Christ actually laughed. And this laughing Jesus was especially embraced among Gnostic teachers. Uh, Within their conception, and I'm thinking now especially of the Gnostic teacher Basilides, At the time of the crucifixion, there was literally a case of mistaken identity. That instead of Jesus, the Romans took the man who had been bearing Jesus' cross, Simon of Cyrene, and crucified him instead of Christ. So that Christ then, standing apart from the action, can literally laugh. Now, that is the crudest representation of the laughing Jesus. A more refined one considers that the reality of Christ as it existed in Jesus was always spiritual. And therefore, this spiritual Christ could laugh even at the moment of crucifixion because crucifixion was merely a physical experience and not something that could damage spirit by its very identity. Uh, This produced a long controversy within the early church because many of the church fathers understood without any shadow of doubt that in fact there was a good reason inside the story of Genesis 22 for taking this argument seriously. After all, the name Isaac actually means he will laugh. It's a up. He will laugh out loud. Uh, this is why the birth of the patriarch within the Hebrew Bible had been such a joyfully received event. So now Gnostic interpreters were saying that this laughter of Isaac prefigured the laughter of the spiritual Jesus. Uh, their argument was so strong that uh, church fathers who represented not the Gnostic but the Catholic position argue that it was precisely when Jesus suffered that he showed his divinity, uh, not when he showed his transcendence of suffering. Uh, The example I give of a church father attempting to use the argument in that way is Clement of Alexandria, who also lived during the second century, the same time that the Gnostic picture of the laughing Jesus was being developed. And the Gnostics uh, really had no uh, no interest in the story of Isaac and uh, Isaac and Abraham as a sacrifice. I mean, uh, you talk about how Marcion had a radically uh, different view of the sacrifice of Jesus. That was one of the most influential ideas in all of theological thinking. Quite an extraordinary development in the understanding of the story. As you says, as you say, it comes from uh, Marcion at this at a time when he was teaching in the city of Rome and developing his distinctive position, uh, which was that when we consider the case of Jesus overall, we have to see that as being a complete transcendence of the God of the Old Testament. In fact, Marcion developed a version of the Bible for Christian use, which didn't have any Old Testament, and which also expurgated the New Testament, 
so as to take out its references to the Old Testament. It's a profoundly radical look at Christianity as a religion completely separate from Judaism. So when he came to the question, why is it that Jesus died in any case if he represents a completely new way of thinking about God? His answer is that the death of Jesus actually paid off the God of the Hebrew Bible. In his understanding, the God of the Hebrew Bible, which he called the Demiurge, that is the lesser divinity, the God of the Hebrew Bible had falsely attempted to pass himself off as being the true God, but in fact he was a limited and unjust God. As a result, when Jesus, who was an innocent person, died at the hands of the Demiurge, the Demiurge had to acknowledge that his own action was unjust. So that now, according to Markingham, humanity was free because a ransom had been paid to the Demiurge, which meant that the Demiurge could no longer claim any control over humanity. And uh, what is the difference in the Islamic version of Isaac's sacrifice from the other two religions? Within the Quran, there is certainly a version of the Akedah, but it has several points which make it really fascinatingly different from the story that we can read in Genesis 22, and also from the development of that story in Judaism and Christianity. According to the surah in the Quran called Al-Safat, uh, which means on the ranks of heaven, that is the angelic circles around the actual abode of Allah, of God. According to the tractate uh, Al-Safat, uh, Ibrahim, which is the way Abraham is referred to in the Quran, uh, Ibrahim is in the midst of a dispute with his own kin concerning idols. And he is actively breaking those idols. And as a result, they come to physical conflict. In the midst of that conflict, Ibrahim calls out to Allah, and he says, give me a righteous son. And the underlying thought here is that with the help of a son, he'll be able to triumph in the resistance of idolatry. Then Al-Safat goes on to say that when this son, who is never named in the Quran, when this son came to the age of work, Ibrahim said to him, my son, I see in a vision that I sacrifice you. What do you see? And then the son says to his father, you must do as Allah requires. Then Ibrahim is at the point of carrying through the action when Allah intervenes and tells him to stop and offers instead the animal, as in Genesis 22, as a tremendous sacrifice in the words of the Quran. Now, there are two fascinating diversions here in the Quran from both Jewish and Christian interpretation of the original story. The one is that the identity of the son is not openly given in the text, which means that Muslim interpretation could go in the direction of saying it was Isaac, as in the case of Judaism and Christianity, or it could say it was Ismael, the older son. And in this case, uh, Islam went in both directions. It, it performed the advice of Yogi Berra, who said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> that is, Islam actually gives you interpretations, especially from its earliest period, when this son is Isaac. But then over the course of time, it develops the motif that the son was only identified in Isaac in the Hebrew Bible as a deception. 
and that really this son was Ismail, the founder of the Arab peoples. So that's one major difference from the whole stream of interpretation we saw earlier in Judaism and Christianity. But the other, and in my opinion, vitally important difference is that the Quranic text sees something that only dimly comes through in the development of Judaism and Christianity. And that is that in the Quran, it is never Allah who asks the patriarch to sacrifice his son. It is only the patriarch's vision, what he believes is required of him. In other words, the Quran, among all the foundational religious texts, of the Abrahamic traditions is the clearest that this impulse to sacrifice our own young doesn't in fact come from the divine world. Instead, it's our own religious atavism which we project onto God so that we suppose that God requires this sacrifice. And one thing I like about your book, which you point out, is that... Uh... It wasn't God might have not sent uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son because he was a righteous man, but more because uh, more maybe as a punishment for all the fumblings and bumblings he'd done beforehand, you know, like trying to give his wife away and other things. Exactly. So that I, I am astounded by how in the West, uh, especially since the 19th century and the contribution of Soren Kierkegaard, we have read the story of Abraham in the Hebrew Bible completely out of context. We keep seeing him as what Kierkegaard calls the knight of faith. Whereas by this time, uh, as you say, he's tried to pass his wife Sarah off as being his sister to Abimelech the king of Gerar, so that he will not be threatened by Abimelech. He's done this before as a kind of nomadic play uh, in order to ingratiate himself to a superior force. But for him to do so at this particular time, uh, in the run-up to Genesis 22, threatens his whole legacy, because at this stage, the birth of Isaac has already been announced. So that if Abimelech, the king of Gerar, had not himself been warned in a divine vision, the whole question of the paternity of Isaac would have been thrown open. Yet, instead of offering any kind of repentance for this action, uh, Abraham goes on and actually makes a covenant with Abimelech, when covenants obviously ought to be between the patriarch and Yahweh, not the patriarch and some uh, Gentile king. So the issue of Abraham's character is very clearly raised within the book of Genesis just prior to chapter 22. And this is one reason for which chapter 22 begins by saying, after these things, that is, after these obvious actions that involved Abraham in disloyalty and selfishness. Now, this is not only a criticism of Abraham that we can plainly see inside the book of Genesis itself when it's read as a matter of context. It's also a criticism that we can see in traditional Jewish literature of a later period. Uh, one of the moments which most moved me as I was going through the research for this book was when I saw the story that occurs in a midrash, an interpretation to the Torah, in which Isaac returns home after the Akedah, and he tells Sarah what has happened. She t he tells her and then Sarah says to her, to him, had it not been for the angel, you would have been slain? And Isaac says yes. And then the text goes on, 
she uttered six cries corresponding to the six blasts of the shofar on the Day of Atonement. And then she died. You see that close connection between the Akedah and Sarah's death that I referred to earlier on. Then the text asks, well, where was Abraham when all this was going on, when his son goes back, tells his wife, and she dies as a consequence? And it explains that he stayed on Mount Moriah. He stayed behind. Why? He had doubts in his heart. And he said, perhaps some disqualifying blemish was found in him, and his offering was not accepted. That is, Abraham is still thinking about sacrifice. <laughs> Jesus. Right? He's still caught up in his own atavism. Yeah. Now, if, if this can be understood in Leviticus Rabbah, among the great Midrashists, why is it that in the modern period, we have to make Abraham into a completely cardboard, noble figure? If we're willing to see his shadows, then we can also see the darkness of human sacrifice itself and learn how to overrule that impulse. And uh, in your book, um, it seems to me, I don't see a way to get away from this, from the, as you say, Abraham's curse. I mean, is the only way to do it to uh, educate and expose people to uh, the the ritual sacrifice of the Jews and Abra Abraham's uh, uh, failings as a human being? I mean, how do we get... How do we stop sending young people to die, basically? I think it does involve a much closer involvement with our own religious traditions when we are religious. Uh, we in the West, especially since the end of the 19th century, have passed through a great oversimplification of what it means to believe. Uh, it's no coincidence that this has been the period of the rise of fundamentalism. And I think it is crucial for us all, uh, if we identify ourselves as believers, to understand closely what it is that we believe in. And if so, then within the environment of Judaism, we would see clearly that Abraham is portrayed not simply as a hero, but as someone who needs to be educated by means of spirit and educated so as to grow away from human sacrifice. And we would learn also within Christianity that at the moment of his own death, Jesus, who is presented by Christians as the perfect sacrifice, himself asked for, as he put it, this cup to pass from him. In other words, Christianity from its earliest sources does not endorse generalized martyrdom. It always demands of someone who might be martyred a full discernment that, in fact, this is necessary. The idea that you can programmatically have young people going out to war on the assumption that that equates to Christian martyrdom completely misunderstands what Christian martyrdom is. And then finally, uh, the Quran is explicit that what came into the mind of Ibrahim that caused him to want to sacrifice his son was in fact not the will of Allah, and that Allah was interested much more in the sacrifice of festivity, which was the origin of sacrifice itself. So that these three Abrahamic religions have all enjoyed rich traditions of interpretation that would permit anyone uh, practicing within these faiths to overcome the call to automatic martyrdom, which is heard far too frequently across the world today. Certainly agree. And on uh, just keeping, if you don't mind, at the theme of the show, uh, about Gnosticism, I read your excellent article on the. Uh, on the I read your excellent article on the uh, New York Sun, the Gospel According to Pagels, 
Could you give us a quick list of uh, some misconceptions and anachronisms that, of Gnosticism that uh, modern people have swallowed and new aged? Yeah, I think the, the difficulty of the new aging of Gnosticism is that its genuine originality is overlooked in an attempt to make it look just like uh, some form of a liberal approach to religion. Uh, so, for example, uh, Gnostics are often portrayed as being proto-feminists, uh, whereas, in fact, there is very good evidence that many Gnostic writings specifically refer to femininity as being a second order of human being as compared to males. You can see this very clearly in a Gnostic text, which has been with us since the 18th century called the Pistis Sophia, and you can see it also at the very close of the famous gospel according to Thomas, where Peter says to Jesus, send Mary from us because women are not worthy of the life. That's clearly an anti-feminine stance that's being articulated. Another mistake uh, is to try somehow to turn Gnosticism into an eco-friendly movement, uh, whereas, in fact, one of the major points of Gnosticism is that our identity as human beings is not to be found in this material world at all, but rather entirely in the world of spirit. So I think that these misconceptions, this new aging of Gnosticism, as you helpfully referred to it, is causing us to miss the point of the genuine contribution that the Gnostics made to our religious consciousness. Okay. Well, I think that's about all the time we have today, Bruce. I would like to uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show and talking about your very uh, powerful book, Abraham's Curse. Mm -hmm. I appreciate this very much, and I must say that I found your questions extremely helpful. Oh, no, thank you, thank you. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a problem. Like I said, it was a powerful book that just jumped at you. It was quite an easy task. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show, and I wish you the best of luck with the book. Many thanks indeed, Miguel. You smell that? You smell that? You smell that? Hey, bun, son! Nothing else in the world smells like that! I love the smell of napalm in the morning. You know, one time we had a hail bomb for 12 hours, and when it was all over, I walked up. We didn't find one of them, not one stinking dink body. The smell! You know, that gasoline smell! The whole hill! Smells like victory. Someday this war is going to end. And there you have it, my beloved truth seekers. Bruce Chilton giving us the chills about his new book, Abraham's Curse. You can play around with outfield theories blanket blaming and theological aerobatics, but only when, in a psycho-spiritual manner, you get to the cancer in the heart of the matter is when you'll have hope in understanding and solving the issues. Most people will still maintain the party line stand that, that it's about oil, ancestral homelands, setting up the eschaton, peace in the Middle East, the moral West, but those reasons are just infected scar tissue over the real wound. The wound is the dagger of Abraham, a fumbling patriarch who blindly served the Demiurge, and his son Isaac, whose name means laughter and laughs at us still from beyond this world at mankind's situation. Isaac was saved, Isaac was killed, Isaac was an adult, Isaac was a holy rabbi brought back to life, Isaac was a kid, Isaac was an adult. Wait, but maybe it wasn't Isaac but Ishmael, the father of the real chosen people, the Muslims. Who was it? Round and round we go, Jack. Move the goalposts just enough 
and you'll have an excuse to bring violence to your brothers and sisters. That is why I champion metaphor, myth, and of course, gnosis. All three tools in breaking the dams of orthodoxy, literalism, and fundamentalism. All three tributaries that lead back to those lagoons of compassion we played in so easily as young children, and even before as supernal sparks of Mother Sophia. You have just found a beginning so that you may understand the end. And perhaps the end, or the many endings, can be halted if we spread the news of how it all really began. We'll see if you still buy the notion of this poorly crafted universe, this veil of tears, this black iron prison. Like the book of Thomas the Contender says in the Nag Hammadi Library, the Archons will give them an illusion of truth and will shine on them with a perishable beauty, and it will imprison them in a dark sweetness and captivate them with fragrant pleasure. But we are the Gnostics, the veterans of a thousand psychic wars. We don't take prisoners, but liberate them one at a time at the virtual Alexandria. We embrace blasphemy because, as Meister Eckhart wrote, that is the best way to get to know God. And heresy shouldn't be this much fun. Thank you so much for emanating yourself on Aeon Bite, formerly known as Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. Go do what you gotta do. Practice your mystery. Watch your children sleep for inspiration. Sigh at the illusion of those pretty woods outside that distract you from your inner gardens. Spread the word in the form of myth and your own gospel. Do not taste death. I am, and I am Abraxas. The road is ended, the song is over. Thought I'd have something more to say. But don't cultivate any troubles, my beloved true seekers. Because like heaven above you, the spy that love you, I'm keeping all of your secrets safe with me tonight. Hello and goodbye as always. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier.